next guest uh, I always look forward to having here. He is a professor of astronomy and space sciences at Cornell, director of the Laboratory for Planetary Studies. He's written a best-selling and fascinating book called The Dragons of Eden. Would you welcome, please, Dr. Carl Sagan. Your name was discussed on this very show last night. We had Ray Bradbury with us, who's a science fiction writer, and we were talking about being out at Jet Propulsion Laboratory and so forth. Yep. Well, what's new in space, Carl? <laughs> See, I like to condense the subject down real quickly and don't start off too big. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think I, think I saw a comment of yours. I don't know if it was in Time or Newsweek. Somebody had asked you about uh, the pictures that are out now. There's Star Wars, Close Encounters, and so forth, and they ask you what you thought. And you thought that they should be... Not that you didn't say they were entertaining, but you thought maybe they should deal a little closer with scientific facts yeah my my sense of them <coughs> is that sort of the 11 year old in me loved them but uh they uh, they could have made uh, a better effort to to do things right uh, a lot of a lot of different aspects of things there's a uh, star wars starts out saying it's on some other galaxy right and then you see there's people and uh scene starting in scene one there's a there's a problem because human beings are the result of a unique evolutionary sequence based upon right. so many individually unlikely random events on the earth in fact i think most evolutionary biologists would agree that if you started the earth out again and just let those random factors operate you might wind up with beings that are as uh, smart as us and as ethical and artistic and all the rest but they would not be human beings that's for the earth so in another planet different environment yeah very unlikely to have human beings. are you saying on another galaxy um it's not possible that there could be... It's extremely unlikely that uh, there would be creatures as similar to us as, uh, as the dominant ones in Star Wars, and there's a whole bunch of other things. They're all white. The skin of uh, all the humans in, uh, in Star Wars, oddly enough, is sort of like, like this. Right. And uh, not even the uh, other colors represented on the Earth are present, much less uh, greens and blues and purples and oranges. They did have a scene in Star Wars with a lot of strange characters yeah but none of them seem to be in charge of the galaxy everybody in charge of the galaxy seemed to look like us <laughs> <laughs> and I, I thought there was a large amount of human chauvinism and also I felt very bad that at the end the Wookiee didn't get a medal also you know all, all the people got medals and the Wookiee who'd been in there fighting all the time he didn't get any medal and I thought that was an example of anti-Wookiee discrimination <laughs> You're dissecting this scientifically, Carl, and taking all the fun out of it for me. Well, that's it. I mean, you can you can view these pictures entirely uncritically. Well, that's really what it was. It was a it was a shootout, wasn't it? A western sure. in outer space. Sure. The good guys versus the bad guys. But my sense is that every picture which touches on science could do that, and at the same time, just a little more effort to get the science right. I remember one comment you made. It was about uh, um, allusion to. Uh, speed when it really had to do with distance. Yeah, the, that's right. The, the parsec uh, or something. Solo, like. that's right. Talked about uh, getting to a certain place in uh, only so many parsecs of time. Yeah. Uh, or speed. Which when, has it's a unit, when it's a unit of distance, it's like uh, saying uh, that uh, from here to uh, San Diego is 30 miles an hour. It just doesn't mean anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But how many people were sitting there that figured that out during well, the picture? That all you got to do is hire one impoverished graduate student and uh, <laughs> get all the facts right. I, I mean, can tell you easy. that. <laughs> uh, I, when Ray Bradbury was on here last night, and I, I think I've asked you this question before, because if I remember in Star Wars, they got up and they got in the spaceship and they were beyond the speed of light, right? Yep. Now, as far as, I guess, science knows, that is supposed to be the finite limit of velocity is the speed of light and nothing can go faster than that and yet in this picture they were going faster than that and i asked ray i said what would it happen and i think i asked you the same question if they found something that was beyond the speed of light how wouldn't that change all of the whole yeah, physical well, conception of what's going on a lot of people are sort of annoyed that uh, physicists should uh, lay any constraints on what we yeah. could do in the future but uh, I think uh, the way to look at it is uh, something like this. This is all due to Einstein. I mean, that's right. laid in his lap, all the people who are annoyed at not being able to travel faster than the speed of light. Um, it's simply this. If no material object can travel at or beyond the speed of light, then there's a great deal of things in the world that are understandable quantitatively in detail. The universe makes sense. 
if it were possible to travel faster than the speed of light, then all of that, that comprehensibility breaks down. And there are a lot of awkward things that can happen, such as uh, effects preceding causes, uh, if you see what I mean. The light goes on, and then you walk to the switch to turn it. And uh, things wasn't there, like wasn't that. there a famous poem about that after Einstein's there was a young lady, lady named, from Bright. Named Bright, who could who travel, travel much faster, faster than, than light. light. She set left. out one way, one day in a relative way and returned the preceding night. Right, that's the one. <laughs> that was little Carl Sagan reciting. And now let's hear our next student. Very good, Carl. You may take your seat. We'll be right back after this and talk about some. <laughs> I was just, we we're talking about Star Wars during the commercial. I said, you realize Star Wars made over $200 million? And he said, you could go to a planet for $200 million, right? It's true. That's what it costs. And, uh, see, it, man's and see it live, right? Unless you go coach. You go <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And then you, you get that one little trade dinners and it's lousy. Um, we start talking. We've talked about this before, but it's the fascination is still mind boggling. You're involved now with looking for extraterrestrial intelligence, right? Put a committee. How do you go about looking for? Well, there, there are a number of popular ideas. How would you know it? I mean, that they were. Maybe we couldn't comprehend what they were trying to tell us. Is that a possibility? Uh, sure, but uh, it's a little like this. If, uh, if you're an advanced civilization and you wish to communicate to a backward civilization, you talk slow and simple and uh, and obviously and we would be the backward civilization because we, we do not have that capability of well, doing we've what we just emerged our technology just barely has come to the point where we're able to send spacecraft to probe in a halting and tentative way the nearby right. planets and in which we're able to construct large radio telescopes to see if anyone is sending us a message and it's this latter end of things that uh, for the first time is now being funded at a quite low level, but uh, the first operational program that uh, uh, NASA has funded is to, uh, in the present, the present budget. And uh, the idea is simply to uh, look at uh, a lot of stars uh, or carve up the sky into little pieces and look at right. each piece and see if there's a message coming to us. Now, Even the nearest one would be? Well, nearest star is uh, a little more than four light years right. away, so if we got a message today, it left that star four years ago. But, you know, we ought to be used to that kind of idea. You look at the sun, you're not seeing it now. You're seeing it eight minutes ago because right. it took eight minutes for light to travel at the speed of light from the sun right. to the Earth. The question of how you would recognize uh, a signal as intelligent, uh, suppose you heard something which said beep, 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 beep. Got and it. went through the first 30 or so prime numbers. That's an answering service. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, you go through the, the numbers. Yeah, and, and uh, there's no natural process which, you know, would, would say 1, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, uh, which are the, unless right. I missed one, the, the, the first few prime numbers. And so you would say, well, look, here's somebody who for some reason is into prime numbers. Prime number is a number that can only be divided by one in itself. Right. Here, here's somebody who's into prime numbers. They've attracted our attention. Uh, there must be more to it than just prime numbers. And then you would look more closely. That's the sort of uh, So you figured the signals scenario. you would get would be in some kind of mathematical... Well, it would, it would be so regular... Which is a universal you, type of... Yeah, that you could only say... The only possibility would be that it was intelligent, and then you would look for the more detailed message, uh, either at faster time resolution or at some adjacent frequency or something of that sort. The remarkable thing is that uh, for all of the history of mankind, uh, people have wondered about intelligence elsewhere. I think it's in religion and philosophy, legends... Oh. But uh, this is the first time that we have the competence and ability to actually do such a, such a search, and we're just beginning. Are we sending out from here some kind of, outside of the thing that you, the plaque that the, you put on the Mariner or Pioneer? Pioneer and on then the, the Voyager record, which we And the record. About are we sending any type of radio signals? Not really. There, there was uh, <coughs> one sort of ceremonial demonstration at the resurfacing of the Arecibo Observatory in 1974. A signal was sent by uh, Frank Drake, 
who's getting married in two days, I thought I might share. Um, but to a place that's 24,000 light years away, it's not a, you know, so if there's an answer, it'll be in 48,000 years. Don't, don't hold your breath. But, uh, that was merely that's really being on hold, isn't it? <laughs> wow. It was merely to demonstrate that uh, it could be done. But, but uh, in general, radio astronomers have not uh, sent out, just have listened. But there are signals that are sent out, uh, including this program. I was going to just accept what I was saying. Is it true that all shows, television, radio shows, that are sent out travel forever through the void? Yep. They do. They do not diminish in... Well, they do. They diminish by what's called the inverse square law, so it goes twice as far. It's a quarter as intense. But somebody with a receiver... With a powerful and receiving antenna and So sensitive. all the television shows and radio shows have been broadcast. Well, the, yeah, the Earth turns, so right. they get jumbled up some. Are being But are still traveling through yep. the cosmos. So it's a little bit like this. You imagine here's the Earth, and around it is a kind of spherical wave front traveling at the speed of light. It's now about 30 light years away from the Earth because the first large-scale commercial television was 30 years ago. And in there is the television programs of the late 40s, Howdy Doody, <laughs> Milton Berle, the Army McCarthy hearings, and other signs of high intelligence on the planet Earth. <laughs> so Somebody could be seeing Burl right now, walking around on the sides of his feet, 30, 30 light in a dress. And, and judging was, us. And judging us, saying, that. well, Og, I think that we got troubles down there. Uh, I just hope they wait till Sesame Street arrives. It'll save us. <laughs> That's fascinating, the idea that uh, goes out there. The, the actual situation is that <clears throat> even if the programs could not themselves be made out, there is no question that uh, a low form of intelligent life on the Earth could be deduced in that way. If you had to make what I guess a calculated guess or the theorize, when do you think it would be, if you think it would, it would happen, when would it happen? Within a period of 10 years, 20, 50 years? See, it depends uh, on how much of an effort we make. If we make no effort, the possibility of detecting such signals is small. If we make a big effort, then the probability goes up and nobody knows to what. Now, people are going to ask you, you say, because it could, this could cost money. You say, OK, you hear from somebody 10 light years away. But by the time you transmit back and forth, what is the value of that? I mean, That's if you have question. to sit around and wait for 50 years or 100 years to get an answer, mm -hmm. There's a lot, there's they're saying, why, well, what are you talking about? A hundred years from now, who in the hell is going to care? We're going to be gone. Well, there's a lot, a lot of answers to that. It's a good question, but uh, it's one worth pondering. For one thing, uh, there's a lot of uh, information in human society which goes only one way. Uh, Socrates talks to us. We don't talk to Socrates. That is, that's what books are about. People who are dead convey their wisdom to so us. somebody could transmit the knowledge of another planet and just send the exactly. direct knowledge. And think of that. Think of a civilization on a different planet evolved under quite different circumstances than here. What is their art like, their music, their science, their technology, their politics? What have they learned? Have they been in contact with still other civilizations? Do they have a repository of such information? Think of how we'd be able to view ourselves in a new way, suddenly to have a new perspective. There's another aspect to it, too, and that is we are at a very dangerous moment in human history. We have weapons of mass destruction. We are in the process of inadvertently altering our climate and exhaustion of fossil fuels and mineral, all, all kinds of problems which come with technology. We are not certain that we will be able to survive this period of what I like to call technological adolescence. Were we to receive a message from somewhere else, it would show that it's possible to survive this kind of period, and that's a useful bit of information to have. Yeah, wouldn't this be something? In other words, somebody has solved a particular problem we are still wrestling with. It's good to know that the problem could be solved. I think it would be very, very useful information. Or some of the medical breakthroughs, some way to end wars or something like that? Maybe. Medical breakthroughs are tougher because I suspect our physiology would be quite different from that of any other creatures if there are some. Also, it's possible that you'd make such a search and the results would be negative. Uh, that's perfectly possible. You don't want to prejudge the outcome. But it seems to me that's an important bit of information also. Right. If it turns out that life, intelligent life, is rare, that makes something particularly precious and valuable about life here. But isn't and it true when you know. talk about 50 light years or 100 light years in astronomical terms, that is a minute distance? It's true. 
I mean, now you can get into thousands of light years and millions of light years. That's right. A light year is about six trillion miles. The distance to the nearest star, as we said, is about four light years. But the distance to the center of the Milky Way galaxy that we're part of is 30,000 light years. The distance to the nearest galaxy is about two million light years. Fascinating book, The Dragons of Eden, and of course you still got The Cosmic Connection, which it's is cool. one of the all time fascinating books. Thanks for being here. It's always a great kick. Lady gynecologist, you'll start when on your show? Tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. Bob, where are you headed? Uh, to the gynecology. <laughs> <laughs> to determine your sexuality. Okay. Uh, tomorrow, Shirley MacLaine will be here. Cheryl Teagues, Ronnie Graham, and jazz great Stan Getz is here. Thank you. I'm humbled by that applause.